Welcome viewers. So for those of you joining me for the first time, this is actually my second video that's a challenge run of Battle for Middle Earth 2, um, but I'll go through all of the introductory stuff real quick just to get you caught up. So I am doing the evil campaign of this game. There are two campaigns, I already did the good one. And my job is to keep my units alive. So I'm following four self-imposed rules for this campaign. Rule number one is that I have to rescue any units on the map that can join my side before the mission is over. This does not count wild structures that I can bring to my side with Untamed Allegiance because I'm not automatically given that power and so I decided that it would be too much of a hassle to include that. Rule number two is that all of my units must survive. Rule number three is that buildings are fair game. I'm not going to protect the buildings, just my builders and units surrounding them. And rule number four is more of a clarification of the survival rule, and that's that army units usually come with multiple soldiers in them, but as long as there's a single soldier left from each unit, then I'll count that as them surviving. A big part of this is that if I have the banner carrier upgrade, or the unit is at least level two, then all of the soldiers will regenerate there anyway, and so my head cannon is just that my soldiers get injured and then the medic brings them back over time. Before I get into the campaign proper, I wanted to mention that as I did with the last video, I got this idea from the channel Giant Grant Games. It's a pretty large channel, and I did look up on YouTube to see if anyone had done this kind of challenge in Battle for Middle Earth 2 or Battle for Middle Earth 1 for that matter. Um, and I didn't see anything, but I did find a YouTuber who got into contact with me who had um, done this. Um, so his channel name is Yofk, and I've been in contact. He's been very helpful and very cool, and I would very much like it if y'all would um, check out his channel as well. And I have the links in my description and up here on the screen too. And I have not seen these videos beforehand because I don't want to be influenced by his strategies that he's used. So I honestly won't know how different our approaches are until I finish up my video and then I go see his videos later. So I think y'all should check them out and compare. So right off the bat, the evil campaign is already seeming more difficult than the good campaign. And I could foresee this because the evil units are a lot weaker than the good units, especially the goblins. They are susceptible to basically any good unit one-on-one, -on -one, and they do not heal automatically like the elves do. So I'm going to try to avoid them whenever possible. But then that gets to the heroes. So I do have four heroes instead of the two in the good campaign. But I would prefer the Glow and Glorfindel combo because these Nazgul will die at the drop of a hat. But anyway, as you'd expect from a tutorial stage, it's very simple. I just have to build up two goblin troops along with some basic buildings and then some cave trolls after I upgrade my fissure. And this lets me attack the elves of Lorien. Now right from the start, I would say that I have a general disadvantage compared to the good campaign because not only are we invading more of a fortress at Karas Galadon versus when we were just defending Rivendell, but as I stated before, the elves are much stronger and they have access to multiple heroes including Haldir, Celebrimbor, and Galadriel herself, although she is much weaker than you'd expect her to be at this stage. We do have some interesting benefits. For instance, we can use our five power to get what I consider the most OP ability, which is scavenge, because not only can we get it right off the bat, but we will be getting resources for every single enemy that we defeat. And that will be really helping us as we continue along throughout the campaign, because we will basically never run out of resources. The only other twist in this stage is that there are three positions where we can rescue mountain giants, and they are very impressive. They actually have more health and probably damage, I haven't measured it, than my heroes. And they basically serve as our auxiliary artillery alongside the cave trolls. And I use them like that until I realized that they were damaging my troops too much, which eventually leads to the death of a cave troll in the first attempt, causing me to switch all of the cave trolls and mountain giants to melee. In the second attempt, I overcompensated by leaving the rest of my troops behind other than my heroes, but they quickly started getting low on health. 
And I realized that they completely upped Galadriel's speed. I don't know if that's because she already had that speed for the ring power, but she was easily keeping up with my Nazgul, one of the fastest characters even mounted on foot, and eventually chased him down until killing him, which was kind of funny to watch. But then eventually I was able to defeat the enemy heroes, use my troops as necessary, and take down their buildings, finishing stage one after three attempts. Now continuing the trend, the second mission at the Grey Havens is a lot more difficult than the good campaign. And I mean it, a lot more difficult. In fact, I'd say that this is the second hardest mission in all of the evil campaign, which probably makes it the third hardest mission overall, and you'll see why. So we start with just a couple of Corsairs, and we're capturing some ship docks. Now, one cool thing about this level, in my favor, is that ships do not count command points, so I could theoretically have an infinite number of ships, with the obvious limitations of my resources. But later on, when I get low enough on resources, it triggers a bonus objective where I can capture an outpost. This lets me get theoretically infinite resources if I'm willing to wait for it. And I'm not really willing to wait, it's a possibility if things get impossible, but that's not really how I want to play this. So there are three stages to this level. It starts with my Corsairs, and I'm just capturing the ship docks and building up ships, which leads to the easiest and first part. All I have to do is destroy some elven transports that are trying to pass by with my ships, and because as I stated before, I can make basically infinite ships, and even if I didn't, they'd stand no chance anyway, it's a very easy part, and it makes sense as a second level of a campaign. Then we get to the next part, where a bunch of transports of my own land with a couple of enemy ships attacking that I have to fend off, and then they land on the beach, creating a giant conflict between the elven troops that are already on the beach and my troops that are landing. As you might expect, this is the roadblock. The third section is that I'm allowed to create a base after I clear the enemy troops off of the beach, and then I can either use bombardment ships from the sea to destroy the fortresses, or I can send my land troops out to attack from the other side. So before phase 2 starts, there are three arrow towers that I have to destroy, and this is what gives me control of my timing. Because before I destroy all three of these arrow towers, I can build up my own resources and then build the ships that I want. So at the beginning, I don't build any ships, or at least I don't send any ships to support my landed troops to kind of see where it is. And very quickly, a lot of land troops are dying, and I kind of figured that that would happen. So then my strategy is either to build a lot of arrow ships or a lot of bombardment ships. So I try both, and, bo and also both at the same time. And it doesn't really help because of the timing. The enemy troops are just charging my troops and I have to cause them to retreat or to make a stand in a way where they'll still survive and it doesn't seem to work out until I get the idea to do a blind bombardment. So I can't attack an enemy that I can't see in the fog of war, but catapult troops can blindly bombard if you just click a spot on the map. So I spend a lot of time with a couple of bombardment ships and just completely fire over all of the beach as far back as I can. It blocks me on the screen a little bit, obviously, but by the time the um, invasion starts and I see the screen, I can tell that a lot of elves have been killed by the bombardments. So using very careful, careful micromanaging of my troops, I'm able to make them survive, barely, and then when I f get my goblin fortress and upgrades later on, I can make all of the goblin troops that didn't have banner carriers upgraded, and this lets all of the troops heal. With the hard part out of the way, I decide to attack the waterfront first, where there are a couple of arrow towers I can take out with my bombardment ships, but then the hard part is gathering up all the ships that I have, and maneuvering them to destroy all the enemy ships and the enemy ports without losing a single ship, so that I can clear the waterway. I can then use my bombardment ships to take out some of the enemy troops on the land, which lets my army relatively safely attack the remaining land troops, which lets me clear the way of the fog of war so that my bombardment ships can take out the fortresses pretty easily. So all in all, we finished a pretty tough mission too in 17 attempts. Now mission 3 is probably the easiest mission in the evil campaign and is also the sickest and is also the funniest mission because all of our goblins under the control of Gorkil the Goblin King scourged the Shire. 
This means that the most resistance that we get is all these little hobbits who just stand no chance. But that was a lie because they also have Dunedain allies, which are actually pretty pesky, and I have to be careful not to let Gorkil die. But the real meat of this mission is that you're supposed to build up a fortress so that you defend against the secret Isengard enemies who attack to try to take credit and territory from you. However, you don't have to destroy the fortress or even all the Isengard units, you just have to kill Wormtongue. And I remembered this from being a kid, so I had my units lay in wait, but in my second attempt, um, because I think, because Gorkil had died earlier, um, I was at the wrong spot, so I quickly sent my Spider Riders and Gorkil to attack the enemies, and I technically won, and obviously any units that are killed after I can't control them doesn't count, but it still seemed pretty suspicious. I couldn't be completely certain that the Spider Riders didn't die before Wormtongue did, so I just redid the mission, um, sent my troops in the right spot so that the moment they destroyed the last Hobbit Seat of Power, I could rush in with all of my units and assassinate Wormtongue and be pretty certain that I didn't lose any of my units beforehand. Now mission 4 isn't too hard, but it is long, but actually pretty fun. It's a it's the Dwarven Fortress of Fornost, and they have a lot of buildings, roaming soldiers, and different weapons that they can use. But I'm given nearly infinite time as long as I can take care of the Dunedain soldiers that are systematically sent against my forces to build up whatever I need to take them down. Yet again, Gorkil and my Spider Riders are my unit of choice because I love me some cavalry units, and I slowly and systematically take them down. Now, eventually I use my good old adage from the good campaign and I just start building up fortresses, and the mountain giant attachments to my fortresses can take down their walls, which makes it way easier to attack them. Now a lot of units, including my goblin soldiers and spiders, can climb walls, but spider riders can't, and it's just not worth using the others just for that small advantage. Destroying everything in the inner walls of Fornost is very easy, but as soon as I start destroying the second walls of Fornost, then their giant weapon has a countdown timer of 3 minutes, I think, before it attacks. Um, I don't think I have footage of the hammer striking because it did strike and it automatically earthquaked my fortress destroying all of my units um, which is unfortunate because it looks really cool but i was able to basically sequence break i built new fortresses to destroy their gates whenever possible and i killed their i killed glowin which is their hero in the fortress and then eventually was able to take everything down with my spider riders and gore kill just making sure that I took my time with it so that the arrow towers didn't damage my troops too much and I was eventually able to take down their fortress. So in mission 5 we travel to Mirkwood to take out Thranduil's forces and own the crossroads because everyone knows that the devil owns the crossroads, not the elves. The three stooges are back along with their parole officer but we also get Shelob who's just, you know, Shelob, Shelob's just a good girl, I don't have anything mean to say about her. But we have our Mordor fortresses, but we are very limited in the way that we can upgrade. First of all, the only upgrades for the fortress themselves that we get are this weak bonfire upgrade. We don't get munitions or extra armor or anything, which sucks. Um, we also don't get catapults or catapult upgrades on the fortresses, which is just annoying. Um, and our trolls are limited too. We can't even get attack trolls. So that's the main annoyance with this mission is how limited we are so basically i start with just my heroes but then realize that there's no way i'm going to get through these elves with just nazgul so i eventually have to get some orc archers and some mountain trolls which are also pretty squishy in order to get all of my troops in one place first there are a bunch of int moots but i don't really have a problem using my heroes to take them down that's just not an issue in, unless i'm being extremely careless and then once I clear an area, there's some spiders that I can take control of with Shelob. Unfortunately, these spiders will automatically spawn taking out my command points. So in my first attempt, I didn't realize this and just had a bunch of spiders that I couldn't use. So I made sure to build up my mountain trolls and archers before getting these spiders in the further attempts. 
Once I reach the map in the north, my job is to clear out the elves that are already here and build arrow towers at each of the glowing plots. And the elves are constantly trying to build towers there and destroy my own. So from the beginning, I don't even try to build towers. I do get the barricade um, spell power, but that doesn't count as a tower being built in a plot, but it is a nice distraction and helps pick off some enemies with cover fire. After several failed attempts with my heroes and my armies to um, take out the elves, I finally decide to just take the map inch by inch, and I slowly advance with my armies while building fortresses in basically every available space, making it impossible for the enemy builders to build towers, and once I finally clear out the final base in the top northwest of the map, I can finally build all of my towers at the same time, immediately completing the mission. With all of this together, it was completed in a relatively painless five attempts. After controlling the crossroads, we are now able to travel to the Withered Heath to recruit Drogoth, the Dragon Lord, the non-canon character. This level is easier in almost every regard to Mirkwood, because not only do we have all of our tools, we can make we can make attack trolls, um, we can make fully upgraded fortresses, we can make catapults. But we also rescue fire drakes three at a time from multiple spots. So as long as we beat the mini dwarven fortresses, we get very powerful units that are as fast as cavalry. So I can link them up with my mounted heroes and build my army as I go along. I just have to make sure that they don't die. Maybe ironically because of the ease of the levels, I do lose a couple of temps. Mostly because of Nazgul, due to the enemy catapults, arrow towers, some of my own catapult fire, and whatnot. But all in all, it's pretty easy to save all of the fire drakes. And then once I do that, I can head to the top northwest of the map, where there are just a few troops of remaining dwarves and men of Dale that pose no problem to my huge amount of fire drakes at this point. And then I can meet with Drogoth the Dragon Lord. Overall, this is a pretty inconsequential level. I mean, I guess it's cool. It's almost like a, a power fantasy, um, if any of the levels can be considered that. But then it doesn't even matter because we don't get Drogoth in the next mission. You'd think if I spent all of this time in mission six, then I'd be able to use the dragon in mission seven. But I mean, at least we're going to get him in mission eight. So same with campaign five. Fittingly, we took six attempts to beat campaign six. For the first time, the same level of the evil campaign matches the same level of the good campaign, and of course it had to be Erebor, so you know that it's going to be a difficult time. We begin the stage in the south of Dale, with just a couple of orcs, some mountain trolls, and some catapults. We have to destroy some buildings in order to get resources and ward off any enemies along the way. I was worried at first that my units wouldn't last very long, and although I lost one attempt, to careless planning, it doesn't take very long before I can get my fortress and other units up and running. I choose to use Haradrim archers and attack trolls as my main forces other than my heroes because those are the best archers that I can get and the attack trolls can take a lot of beatings and take out a lot of troops at once. But unfortunately, since attack trolls can't heal, I have to be very careful when to deploy them. While the amount of enemies in this version of Erebor isn't as overwhelming, the dwarves that are sent my way still are annoying to deal with, and it splits my troops into multiple sides, mostly because this stage is a battle of time and resources. I can't build up my resources very quickly, so I'm forced to send my Nazgul and catapults to try to get some extra resources from the buildings, but the dwarves will keep on coming, and I know that a, an attack force led by Glowin and a summoned fortress will get me from the south. So I have to make sure that I build up walls and some towers in order to try to ward them off, but even those defenses don't guarantee my success. And as you might have expected, sending my heroes off alone to deal with some buildings in Dale can cause them to die very easily the moment that my attention is lost. Finally, I was barely able to manage my time and resources to get proper walls, build arrow towers that I could hide my builders in since I don't have access to goblin tunnels, and then have my army clustered together with my heroes on either side in order to take down the dwarven troops and fortress before they can destroy any of my units. Then the only thing I have to do is to cluster my army in the center, build a defensive fortress just in case, 
and then invade the main fortress of Erebor, where a lot less units than you'd think are defending it, and I'm, and I'm able to take down the main fortress relatively easily. All of that was easier said than done, because it took 24 attempts in order for me to complete this Deathless, but I was finally able to defeat Glowin for the last time, and to take down King Dane. I do still think that Erebor was harder in difficulty than the final level, but Rivendell has plenty of tricks that it throws at me, starting from the very beginning, because I lose my first attempt from a couple of elven cavalry and army units that are right outside where my base starts. I'm given some goblin archers from the very beginning, but they can die to one single arrow, arrow volley, which is continuously regenerated and thrown at random units of mine throughout the level, so I have to make sure that they are inside a tunnel at all times, alongside the builders and any other units that can die to one arrow strike, like spider riders. Through careful use of my beginning pikemen and gore kill, I'm able to take out the first few units, including Glorfindel, so that they don't wipe out my fortress, and then I can start building ground. I use Drogoth and Shelob as my main two units slash heroes to scout around the south of Rivendell and make sure that I've gained all my territory before beginning my assault. My next challenge was self-inflicted. I wanted to build resources more quickly, so I built some labor camps, but these spawn laborers. So if my laborers die, then I lose. So I end up just sending my laborers to the back of my fortress, where enemy powers and units won't reach. Or if they do reach at that point, they definitely would have killed other units before then. I would love to use Drogoth with flying units, but unfortunately I can't spawn infinite flying units like I could with the Eagles and the Good campaign, so I just have to be very careful with Drogoth. And even when I eventually get the Nazgul on their Fell Beast and the Witch King, they're not invincible because the enemy arrow towers shoot a lot more than the Dol Guldur arrow towers because they're armed with Mirkwood archers. So one secret that I use is that I use the Summon Barricade, which isn't detected by the enemy towers for some reason, and I slowly but surely build them up and take out every single tower and the Mirkwood archers within them before sending any flying units or army units into the base. The next challenge is that when I start attacking Galadriel and the west side of Rivendell with my barricades, then she'll start attacking with some troops. She has her ring ability powers, and so she's very powerful, but going through my barricades starts to wear her down, and by the time she reaches one of my fortresses, I can take her out with my heroes. Even after wearing her down, sometimes when I wasn't careful, she would kill my Nazgul or, or Gorkil, which obviously would end the run. But after Galadriel's defeated, immediately Tom Bombadil will spawn, as well as several eagles. So I have to make sure that none of my troops can be picked off by the eagles before they're shot down by my fortress, or completely demolished by Drogoth, like this one run where I used his powers to wipe them out. After that, like I mentioned, I have a unit full of Felbeast and Drogoth that I can use to attack from the east, and this will spawn the Fellowship. Now I try to use my flying units to defeat them since only Legolas was supposed to be able to damage them, but apparently Gandalf's lightning ability can strike them down and I lose one attempt to that. But thankfully my fortresses were enough to occupy the army of the dead before they could wipe out any of my units, and I can take out the fellowship, and this gives me Sauron. I love using Sauron even though he's never the most efficient unit to use because he's just so fun. Naturally, since I have Sauron, I want to 1v1 Elrond. For my first few attempts with Sauron, I have a hard time isolating Elrond, but I eventually get him to where he'll aggro onto a bridge, and it's a 1v1 with Sauron against Elrond. But something's wrong. When I do the 1v1, Elrond wins. I counted, and he defeats Sauron in 11 hits, which is ridiculous. Sauron has 10,000 life, I think? And so that's almost a thousand damage per hit, which is way more than Elrond should be able to do. But if I use the Word of Power ability or the Reign of Fire ability with Sauron, I can still technically win the 1v1 and that's good enough for me. Then I can send my flying units from the eastern side to take out Arwen and the structures there, while using mounted units including summoned fire drakes from my fortresses, the heroes, and spider riders from the west to slowly encroach on the fortress. I want to destroy not only the mini fortresses and all the units, but every single structure I possibly can to make sure Rivendell is absolutely defeated. 
And then at the very end, just for fun, I use one of Sauron's special summoning abilities along with one of my 20 powers to finally summon units. Because as long as their time doesn't run out, I don't lose the challenge. So I summon three Balrogs and they whip Inferno up and annihilate the Great House of Elrond. Because of my many desires to complete this in a specific way, I lost a lot of attempts for no reason, but it still ended up being 22 attempts, which was still less than Erebor. The Evil Campaign was a decent challenge and a lot of fun. And I didn't do this for the good campaign, but I thought it'd be fun to list out my death tolls. So at one death each, I have a cave troll that died in mission one, a white that I accidentally summoned in mission six and its time limit ran out, a normal troop of orcs that died in Erebor, I believe, the mouth of Sauron that died in Erebor, and then attack troll that died in Erebor, and laborers that died in mission 8. Next, my two deaths are two catapults that died in Erebor, two builders that were destroyed in Erebor, and two half-troll marauders that were destroyed in the Grey Havens. Next, I have three corsair ships that died in the Grey Havens. Gorkil the Goblin King died three times in various levels. Three mountain trolls died in Mirkwood and Erebor and Drogoth the Dragon Lord died three times in Rivendell. So now that we've gotten here, we have our top three deaths. In third place is a two-way tie between Goblin Soldiers that died in the Grey Havens at four deaths and Sauron that died in his 1v1s in Rivendell. In second place, we had Corsairs who died seven times in the Grey Havens and it's not even close, coming at number one, you guessed it, it's the Nazgul who died 20 times. <laughs> to be fair, I didn't differentiate the Nazgul on the fell beasts from the Nazgul on the horses, and I should have because they're different hero units, but I thought it'd be funnier to just have the total Nazgul death. So anyway, if you've stuck around at this point, please subscribe. Subscribe to Yofk if you like this kind of content. And I might try the Witch King expansion, even though I know it'll be way harder than these challenges.